So, a thousand years ago in 2013, Xbox announced their new console, the Xbox One, would be always on. So, like, you couldn't disconnect it from the internet while playing your games. So, you know, Microsoft's an American corporation, and of course, lots of people's first question was, how are the troops gonna play their X-Bones when they're deployed? Oh, and of course, people who don't have access to the internet for one reason or another. And Microsoft said, well, somebody named Don Matrick, who no longer works for the company and has a Wikipedia page that reads like a resume, said, We already have a console for those people. It's called the Xbox 360. What a mistake. Microsoft alienates troops. Hey, troops, buy a PS4. <laughs> I was confused by absolutely everything in the year 2013, but the response to Microsoft's comments made a lot of sense to me, even if the issue wasn't going to affect me because I'm not a troop, I don't know if you've noticed. There are always gonna be contingent factors that could disrupt an internet connection that are outside of the player's control. Your router could die, your console might just be unable to connect to your router for some reason, or maybe you just don't have internet temporarily, or you live in a rural area with poor coverage. If there are circumstances outside of people's control which prevent them from being able to even play a trendy game, they shouldn't be penalized for that, should they? Anyway, there was an uproar for about a week over this, and Microsoft's announcement that they were going to, like, arrest you for using discs. In response to the backlash, they walked back these ideas and the glorious Xbox One was born. The creators had a specific experience in mind when they designed the console, but it was going to alienate lots of people. A minority of the player base, but lots of people. And on top of that, the troops! So what should Microsoft have done? Should they have considered those people from the outset? And if so, why? Especially considering the vast majority of their player base probably would have a stable, uninterrupted internet connection most of the time. And this brings me to the easy mode debate. When difficult games come out, one question resounds, should these games have easy modes? After all, they're hard to play. From software's games especially, well, actually any Souls-like, is really inaccessible to all but the most experienced gamer. Some heathens even say that what's now become the genre's selling point, its difficulty, or the fact that it stacks the deck against you until you learn how to get a flush house, may actually be one of its flaws. The argument goes that adding an easy mode would ameliorate some of these problems and make Souls-like games more accessible to the vast majority of the market, and more interestingly, to people with disabilities. Bear in mind, People with all kinds of disabilities already play Souls-likes and other games. I know it seems really obvious, but it's something that's easy to forget when we have conversations about accessibility. What is accessibility? Because I've said that word a lot, I think, so far. Accessibility is what we use to describe the practice of removing barriers, like Making something accessible means allowing somebody into something by, for example, adding a ramp to get into a building, automatic doors, subtitling a video, braille, those bumpy things on sidewalks, service dogs, sign language interpreters, different kinds of seating. I wrote a lot of examples down. <laughs> Without these things, some people are locked out, literally and metaphorically, from day-to-day -day life. Barriers to access are things that prevent people from doing things as easily as other people can do. Sometimes these can just be inconveniences, but when they're at their worst, they can prevent you from being able to get a job, or make friends, or find a place to live, or get into a building. Accessibility is about identifying these barriers, the stuff that makes things unnecessarily harder for people. Lots of able-bodied people who have never worked in accessibility reflexively understand what that means, but I don't think that we really, in our heart of hearts, understand what it's like to need something to be made accessible. We build the world around a very particular kind of person, who can hear, speak, see, who doesn't tire from walking upstairs, who can walk upstairs, and who stays that way forever. Call him Harold as a shorthand. Harold never gets old. He's never injured or ill. He's really quite remarkable. And it's so natural to conceive of the world from Harold's perspective. Like, I'm sure you can see how this causes problems sometimes. Most people's needs will change over the course of their lifetime, and not everybody's needs are going to be the same. Maybe at some point in your life you'll break your foot and you'll need to use a ramp. Maybe as you get older, your vision will require bifocals. That's what my grandma has. That's not to say that things are intentionally made inaccessible, it's just that when we're so used to thinking about building around Harold's needs, the people who are least like Harold are left to make do with what's good for Harold. And Harold doesn't need a wheelchair, so why should you? The goal here is not about making sure nobody slips through the cracks or making sure that nobody is ever left out. It's just to make sure that less people slip through the cracks of the Harold-shaped vase. For gaming companies, you can probably imagine, this is an increasingly important area of interest because slow as they've been to clue in, they're realizing they can grow their largesse by letting more people play and they get to cash in on the feel goods for doing it. I'm never gonna ever forget about that Xbox accessibility controller commercial that congratulated Microsoft for being so excellent after 
how many years of not doing that? So in video games, accessibility means removing barriers to play. We all know that using the Wiimote feels like you're shaking hands with the ghost of an incorrigible prankster child. I can only imagine what it's like to try to use that thing when you're not exactly like the able-bodied person who playtested it. Start. No. There's a 50-50 chance that I'm going to get what I want here. Fuck. Yes! There are tons of ways to make things accessible that you might even be surprised to learn about. Laura K. Buzz has an entire series called Accessibility, wherein she talks about all kinds of things that present barriers to disabled gamers, along with solutions that honestly blew my mind. Some of these suggestions are so simple, but they're also things that almost feel like industry standards. Things like adding an option for a minimap and having pausable and replayable cutscenes. These are ways to make things easier for people who have ADHD. Did you know that? I mean, maybe if you have ADHD, you probably... I, I also keep track of a few websites that are dedicated to checking if games are playable for people with certain disabilities. There are so many different ways that games can be made more accessible, more playable, and it's super cool to figure out what people are doing to, to do that. So what does this have to do with challenge? <sighs> Okay, here's another definition. I think this is the last one. Challenges are problems that are designed to be overcome with the player's knowledge of the game and skill, usually by exerting some sort of effort of some kind. Scaling challenges according to people's needs might not just be about removing barriers to access. It might be about twisting them around, substituting different pieces, or in other words, translation. To Harold, the guy that we're getting to test our controls, a speedy enemy means lots of quick thumb movements or you die. So making this specific aspect of a game's difficulty more accessible would involve sampling feedback from people with different disabilities and how they might approach that sign differently. And maybe if somebody can't move quickly, this is a way to think about what the essence of your challenge is. If you're just testing physical prowess, then I mean, like, why are you making games for people who play video. I don't have, I have no muscles anymore. <laughs> but if a game designer finds that there's something else that's more core to the experience, this is a good way to think about how to adapt that mechanic while still maintaining that core experience. The reason why it's important to think about what kind of player we design around is, well, the player is a component of the game too. I'm not going to go too far into the weeds on this, but if you're in the mood to read about game design, I will be linking a book in the description. I'm emphasizing this now because it's easy to think of players in neat categories, likers of the game and dislikers of the game, and these people were always predestined to be in one or the other group, and it's easy to think of the player as an entity apart from the artist's vision, but you know, maybe the game likers, every now and again, just happen to be similar to the people after whom the player component was modeled. The more specific word that gets thrown around in this conversation is modulation, or how we make adjustments to fine-tune something. There's a huge debate about this subject, but there's something that's very, very interesting about this word, and I'll spoil part of the video for you now. For differing reasons, most of the people who advocate for and against difficulty modulation converge on this subject. There is no uniform way to modulate difficulty, and so developers have to think creatively when they do it. An easy mode that just cranks down the HP on enemies is not necessarily the best solution for accommodating people's various needs. Here I thank streamer Half Coordinated for tweeting about this and making me aware. You can make a game easier, fine, but the spirit child handshake motion controls are still prohibitive to people with mobility issues. You might be wondering why I'm using easy mode synonymously with accessibility modes, especially if easy mode is kind of a misnomer for the term accessibility mode. And I have three super good reasons for this, so. For one thing, and I am pulling from half coordinated again here, so sorry everyone for my lack of originality, but I can think of situations where difficulty modulation would serve as a kind of accommodation for somebody's needs. For another, I have a hard time seeing how accessibility modes don't make things easier for people. By finding a way to include a hard of hearing or deaf person in the soundscape of the game, I would assume you're making it easier because you're not forcing that person to work around a barrier that shouldn't be there. My last reason for doing this though is that there are some people who will say, some games are for some people and other games are for other people, and if you've not been able to play a game because you, it wasn't designed with your disability in mind, then t too bad, so sad, Sandra. <laughs> Enjoy the games that you can play, I guess. You're probably right that a more precisely worded video would distinguish between an easy mode and an accessibility mode and try to find times where they overlap or where they don't, but that's not what this video's gonna be. We're working at a kind of lower level of uh, knowledge here, so you get what you came for. Anyway, see you at the end of the video where you will regret being here. Ugh.
These problems on a foundational level boil down to two pieces. One is how game designers craft and balance difficulty, think about Harold, and two, how a game design might create barriers which interfere with the player's ability to play the game. Some folks object, for varying reasons, to adding either modulations or easy modes in games, and one reason is, adding easy modes to Souls likes would distance the game from the creator's original vision. We should maintain games so they're as true to the creator's intent as they can possibly be. After all, these games are designed to be difficult. Once upon a time, I insisted easy modes and hard modes were effectively offering the exact same experience. So, Harold, you're right. Easy modes are different from harder modes. I mean, if we stick with this language idea, we have to admit that the Estonian thub of movie is distinct from its English counterpart. Oh! It's fair to apply the same sort of thinking to difficulty in video games. To say that an easy mode is less authentic, though, it's not quite right. You'd have to ignore that inaccessibility is actually a barrier that pops up for some players, but not others. It's something that intervenes in a player's engagement with the game, and it bars them from the intended, authentic experience. Like a glitch or unintuitive controls, except these things get fixed in patches for a reason. They're posing a challenge that's not integrated into the rest of the game, and it's putting the player in a position where they're having to labor to play. Plus, a developer might design meticulously and just forget about the fact that we all aren't like fucking Harold, and you know what, that happens. However, I think that saying this is worse for the creative health of the medium than actually criticizing it. It gives license to creators to not recognize when the negatives outweigh the positives in service to their non-existent pure vision. FromSoft's games though, <sighs> okay, firstly, Harold, you already haven't played the game in the way the creators originally intended for you to. Do you wanna know how I know that? Raise your hand. Everybody, not just Harold, you can all raise your hands. If you didn't play any of From Software's games in Japanese. Hands up, let's see them. Okay, my, sorry, I can't see your hands actually. But you know what stinks of a putrid hypocrisy to me, Harold? You say that you wanna play the game as it was originally intended, and that the mere availability of other modes is deauthorizing the version that you play. This is a very extreme take. Explain to me then, how do you feel about the modding community? Or better yet, speedrunners. Speedrunners are intentionally making the game more difficult by creating fake rules and playing the game according to those. Worse still, sometimes developers even make changes to limit or expand on what speedrunners are able to do. The speedrunning community has a very different experience with their chosen game than the people who just play them outright, and their actions can even influence the actual coding of the text. Isn't that interfering with its authenticity? Are we playing a less authentic version if we're not making it more difficult for ourselves and we're slow pl playing, playing, playing? So, Harold, it's all or nothing, my boy. If you're gonna say nay to people having the option of playing easier modes for the sake of authenticity, then you must also say nay to the people who play fast. That is not what the creators originally intended. Souls likes are not made to be speedrun. One thing that bothered me about Bloodborne when I was playing it is the difficulty is balanced around the assumption that the player can go for 45 hours without needing to pause. When someone's playing and their fucking asshole mailman rings the doorbell, they can't pause, and then they die in the middle of a fight because they have to leave the game, or their hand just starts hurting, and then they try to pause and you fucking can't. That is not something the developers incorporated into their original experience. They didn't program babies to unexpectedly vom on your floor at random intervals to test your allegiance to the game. This is an aspect to Bloodborne's challenge that's unfair, and I would say not good, because extenuating circumstances, life can pull at the player unexpectedly at moments that they just can't help. So pausing makes the game easier in ways that don't fluidly conform to the developer's vision, but at the same time, People with sore wrists or vomiting baby mailmen aren't punished for having normal lives if it's there. And you know what? If they had wanted to, all From Software would have had to do is embed an option in its menu to turn pausing on and off. Although most of you are probably on board with the idea of offering accommodations for people with disabilities, someone among us might still hesitate to encourage developers to offer easier modes in games because there are people who just aren't good at the game who might use it. So let's talk then about the other meaning to the word accessibility, kind of synonymous with palatable. <laughs> oh, 
because that does overlap a bit. I mentioned the vomiting baby men earlier, partly to illustrate that what's good for people with disabilities can actually be good for everybody. So here's a video that I like also. It's by Game Makers Toolkit, whose core argument is that communication is key. These extra modulations should be available, but the developer can, nay, should, signal that they did not intend for the game to be played with these accessibility options. That's a great point! More than just offering a different difficulty level, it's beneficial to signal to the player what the mode does and how it's different, so people can play with adjustments and be aware they might get a richer experience by trying without, if possible. So I'll tell you a story about myself. When I was a teeny kid, like I think I was three years old when I did this, I would play Wolfenstein 3D and Quake together with adults on our stone tablet Windows 95. PC. One of us would control the directional buttons, the other would control the mouse. I realize now that I had modulated difficulty by splitting up a single player experience into a two player experience. It was easier and it was less scary because these were horror games, but doing this might have molded me into the gamer girl that I am. That and Tomb Raider Barbie. <laughs> Why, this could be the greatest treasure of the modern world! I'm reporting as Barbie, world class explorer. Fucking classic. Sometimes when we make adjustments to a thing to make it easier for people to get into, it, it makes it easier for people to get into it. And that's okay, because we aren't getting rid of the other thing, are we? We're giving people a chance to get to know the thing. Ask it some personal questions. Maybe one day easy mode people will go to the hard mode, but the fact of the matter is that sometimes it takes little bouts of confidence building to become a tenacious gamer. And I'm one ten thousand percent sure most developers would rather their players get into the game in a different way than give up on it altogether. Like, come on, Halrod, you're telling me that if there's a choice between a bad translation and none at all that we should just choose option two? Yes, Bethesda makes bad games. However, it's not a natural consequence of modulating difficulty when a game just gives enemies more hit points on a higher difficulty and calls it a did a day, instead of doing something to translate that over to the higher difficulty. In fact, this is an argument for more attentive game design. I played through a handful of games over the past few months in between um, dying, and I had got some ideas for how game modulation can be done really well besides everything in the sources that I've recommended in the description. Ukulele and the Impossible Lair has the tonic mechanic, which you first collect in the world and then you unlock with quills. Some of the tonics are just quirky cosmetic changes. Some of them make the game objectively easier, for example by adding more checkpoints to a level, and some make the game harder maybe by taking away all but one checkpoint. The ones that make the game easier have the side effect of reducing the amount of quills that you collect, while the ones that make the game harder give you bonus quills. So if you challenge yourself, you get to unlock more of these different modes that you can mix and match sooner. Difficulty is incorporated into the game's economy, and you can customize your experience according to what's challenging for you. I will say that when you die 80 billion times, and if you have a checkpoint, you get the opportunity to skip over single sections of a level. There is a caveat to this though, if you do this too much, you won't be able to unlock the rest of the game using in-level collectibles. So the game offers you a way to alleviate your frustration from repeated failure while also incentivizing you to face the challenge again. The best part is the game is incentivizing you to try the harder way. That's the whole gimmick behind the impossible lair. You're supposed to fail as many times as you can until you get good or find a kind of combination of pieces and parts that works well for you. Um, so, okay, we'll talk about the next three a little quickly just to save time. Transistor has a similar system to Yolatl. You can equip optional debuffs for an experience boost, so the more you use them, the faster you level up, but the harder the game becomes in different ways. Pathfinder Kingmaker has some very detailed customization options, and while I still hate people who want to play Pathfinder, I was impressed with how robust the difficulty settings were. Most importantly, there's Celeste. I suck at Celeste, and I think that's because I've kept trying to play it with a mouse and keyboard instead of a controller. Celeste is famous for its accessibility settings, with granular modulations available that you can customize to work out the best experience for you. Okay, takeaways. What is there to know now that you're thinking about some of these different ways to modulate difficulty? Obviously, it can be done well, and I would really recommend that the people who are discouraging implementing easy modes learn to recognize that. Because I know that you didn't all burst out of the womb playing games on destroy yourself mode, and it's weird not to acknowledge the times when difficulty modulation is done right. These experimentations can set new standards for how games are made, becoming ingrained in the way that we release games. It's not abnormal for game reviews to comment on a game's settings, how much you can adjust brightness, audio, controller sensitivity, 
key rebindings availability. So when you say that some of these accessibility settings shouldn't be normalized, you're being selective for no good reason. We already customize our experiences. Let's think about the pause feature thing again. What if instead of automatically disallowing it, Neo embedded the option to turn that feature in on in its menu? So if your poor little hands are sore, or if you have a mobility issue, you can turn it on if you want extra challenge. Oh my god! Neo did implement Oh my god! Oh, pack it up, everybody! There's no art that's authentic anymore. The babies have won. Some games will benefit from that difficulty modulation, but difficulty is not a monolith. What makes a game difficult depends on a variety of moving pieces lining up in precisely the right way. So, okay, we've reached the point where we now have to talk about temptation. Yes, really. Now, this is where things start to get a little out of hand. Easy mode naysayers are accused occasionally at this point, of being elitist. The way the accused responds to this is to moralize about playing easy modes, calling people who use them lazy babies who do not want to put the work in. Dark Souls is about perseverance, goddammit! Forget coronavirus, there's another kind of disease plaguing this here gaming community, and that disease is temptation. Weak world gamers are opting to play games on easier difficulties. The world's looking bleaker by the day, girls. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna treat this argument seriously. I can't. Look at this comment I found. Do not learn. Do not improve. Do not grow. What the fuck? Okay, so not everybody is in the exact same place that you're in, stranger. Now, I wish this was me strawmanning a lot of the people who are against implementing easy modes, but this is not an unpopular perspective. This attitude grows from vast, extant swaths of the gaming communities that condescend to people who just fucking suck at video games. As if some of us don't need a little help sometimes. As if you people understand every word of every book that you read without needing a dictionary. As if you're able to watch art house cinema without getting bored. As if none of us have ever needed a walkthrough or somebody to just hold our hands and explain what it all means. I absolutely agree that people benefit from diversifying their media diets but I absolutely reject the idea that people ought to be condescended to like this if they're put off by the difficulty level of Dark Souls, but still also want to experience the game. If you're talking about people being tempted to take the easy way out, I don't think that you actually care about artistic integrity or making sure that everybody gets to experience the best parts of this game that you loved so dearly. It's basically common practice to call people who want to try a popular game babies because they're intimidated by a higher difficulty. And if you do this, you're a busybody. Because maybe easy mode users need somebody to hold the directional keys for them while they use the mouse at first, and in the process they'll come to love what they see so much that they work up the courage to play it themselves. And some people are put off by difficulty, because they're worried that people will judge them for sucking. Even if they're alone, it's hard for some people to have fun when they feel like they're inadequate. Like there's an invisible judge sneering at them, and I mean, Dark Souls does sneer a little bit. I won't sneer. You can play with me. I, who cares if you suck? I'll help you with the hard parts, and we can laugh together, because I suck too. The pain makes you who you are, and it's okay to wish it gone, but don't hate yourself, Harold. He's redeemed. Harold is redeemed. I think there are a few legitimate reasons why people might not be able to add accommodations in this hellscape that we live in. It can be costly, and you might not have the time or physical ability to implement these measures. But you know what? I don't believe that From Software, a company with over 300 employees, which is also a subsidiary of a corporation with revenues in the billions, can use that excuse. FromSoft's games are not just little niche darlings for hardcore gamers anymore. They've inspired a new subgenre, and the company's huge. Their work is becoming more mainstream now, and working conditions are still unforgivably abject. Look at these numbers, by the way. How many hours of overtime for the equivalent of about 32k USD? Okay, focus. FromSoft doesn't need you defending them. If anything, we should be asking what the company could be doing better at this point. And here we return to that question about the troops and the Xbox One that I asked you at the beginning of this video. I know, it feels like it was a long time ago. What do you think Microsoft should have done? Do you think the pushback was justified? Don't get me wrong. In a lot of ways, it was well-founded. Xbox was planning to take away player customizability by forcing you not to share your games and also stick a Cortana in your toilet or something. But were the troops' best interests at heart back then? And were they in conflict with the artistic integrity of some of the games that Microsoft envisioned having on their platform. I can't give you the answer here, you're gonna have to work it out yourself. Here's where I have to confess though that I pulled a lot of these comments from this video here. I want us to really think deeply about who we're enabling when we make videos dissuading developers from trying. This delightful specimen, for instance, says, 
Thankfully, Japanese developers don't care about whining Westerners. Well, commenter, I have the advantage of existing at a later point in time when this one study was published, and boy do I have some news for you. Not only do Japanese people care about some Westerners whining, they care about Japanese people whining. <laughs> this study surveyed major gaming companies in Japan, like Nintendo, Konami, the whole Scooby gang, and they found out that pretty much all the ones that opted to be part of the study cared about making games accessible to even old people. Yeah. Old people, the fakest posers in the world. These people are sneering at the idea of trying new things. And for what? Because I think they fear change. It's easier to snark about people being overzealous wimps than it is to process change even when it's happening right before your eyes. Now, okay, I'm breaking one of my cardinal rules. I try not to psychoanalyze anybody in my videos because you can hardly know intent and you can really not know what anyone's feeling. People's inner worlds are secret gardens locked away from prying eyes. I'm indulging now though because truthfully, I fear change. I, at one point in time, reacted this same way to this same subject. I don't want things to change. Even though in 20 years I might look back and know that things that I love were never perfect the way that I thought they were, and in retrospect, they actually had some pretty glaring flaws from some angles that I noticed after turning them around a little bit in the light. Let me tell you something cringy about myself. Sometimes I get so defensive about things that I like that I don't want them to become popular. There are YouTube channels that are very famous and popular now that I had found when they had less than 100 subs and I resent their audiences because these things are not my special little secret anymore. I would watch the communities around these things change and I felt scared. I used to hinge my identity on the things that I liked and they were safe and stable and exactly as they were, but people with disabilities already play Dark Souls. There are people who hopelessly suck at souls likes who do manage to push through them. And while some people are able to overcome a game in spite of the fact that it wasn't designed for them, there are others who can't. And these games are not perfect. The experience could be more accurately translated to different people's needs. There's no such thing as a perfect work of art because there's no such thing as a perfect person. Not all games are for everybody in terms of preference, of course, but if we use that as an excuse to not think about why some people can't play or don't play, we're missing the chance to think about how things could be done a lot better. Games are designed around a specific kind of player, and it's not someone else's fault if the artist didn't consider how that design might actually shut some people out completely. And not because of their tastes, but because they just don't have the password. So I am not content to say that if you can't play these games, they're not for you. I think we should experiment, see what about the way games are designed is favoring a person whose body is a very specific way, even if we don't mean for that to happen. And if everything that From Software does is the best that they can possibly do, then okay, maybe what we can talk about is paying workers and giving them days off. Art is a piece of you that you send off into the world. Goodbye, there it goes, it looks like shit. If we're not thinking of who we're making it for, then maybe we're not making it at all. That's my conclusion. <laughs> Thank you to my patrons, who are my children. You signed the contract, bitches. Sheldon W. Josie the Riveter. Femi. Shreya G. Pat Healy. Thomas. Eric. And Joseph Abrams. I look forward to seeing you grow up into adults who are still obviously in charge of their own affairs. Goodbye. <laughs>